On this edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Pope Paul VI identifies in the movement of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers. And this movement of the Holy Spirit is not limited in any sense to the, the bounds of the visible Catholic Church, but it's a, a wave of renewal that embraces all Christian denominations. We are now living in a graced time where the Pentecostal dimension of the church is more evident. If we look at the beginning of the 20th century onwards, we see evidence in history of an outpouring of charismatic experience. This is often referred to as charismatic renewal or Pentecostal revival in the church. Now, although this charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church may be in a bit of a decline, perhaps, in North America, it's actually growing like wildfire in many areas of the church, especially if you look in the third world, in India, in Africa. The Second Vatican Council in the 1960s and also many recent popes have really placed an emphasis and stressed the importance of the charismatic renewal movement in the Catholic Church. So let's take a look at the writings of the Council and also the writings of recent popes about charismatic renewal. Firstly, the Second Vatican Council included the following statement on the use of charisms. This is a very fundamental teaching of the church about charismatic renewal. It is not only through the sacraments and the ministrations of the church that the Holy Spirit makes holy the people, leads them and enriches them with his virtues, allotting his gifts according as he wills. He also distributes special graces among the faithful of every rank. By these gifts, he makes them fit and ready to undertake various tasks and offices for the renewal and building up of the church. As it is written, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit is given to everyone for profit. Whether these charisms be very remarkable or more simple and widely diffused, they are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation since they are fitting and useful for the needs of the church. Extraordinary gifts are not to be rashly desired, nor is it from them that the fruits of apostolic labors are to be presumptuously expected those who have charge over the church should judge the genuineness and proper use of these gifts through their office, not indeed to extinguish the spirit, but to test all things and hold fast to what is good. Now that extensive quote from Vatican II references 1 Corinthians 12, which lists charismatic gifts, as well as 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which talks about the need to distinct, discern the action of the Holy Spirit. Vatican II also spoke of the use of the charisms by the laity. We read, the Holy Spirit sanctifies the people of God through the ministry and the sacraments. However, for the exercise of the apostolate, he gives the faithful specialized gifts besides, allotting them to each one as he wills for the building up of the whole body in charity. From the reception of these charisms, even the most ordinary ones, there arises for each of the faithful the right and duty of exercising them in the church and in the world for the good of men and the development of the church, of exercising them in the freedom of the Holy Spirit who breathes where he wills. So we see here that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not merely for those of great holiness or those who are in the hierarchy or those who have a special position or office in the church, but to faithful of every rank, and that there's a duty to exercise these charisms. Now, this has always been the teaching of the church, but there's a renewed emphasis on the role of the laity in Vatican II. And part of this emphasis is pointing out that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are present in the laity and that they need to be exercised. Finally, Vatican II spoke briefly of the role of priests in discerning these charisms of the laity. While trying the spirits, if they be of God, they, the priests, must discover with faith, recognize with joy, 
and foster with diligence the many and varied charismatic gifts of the laity. So the priest does have a particular role of identifying charisms that are present in the laity, of being joyful when they recognize these charisms, not being jealous of the laity for taking on their role in the church, but of cooperating with laity, of being co-workers to foster the use of the charisms in the laity. So here we see the collaborative role that priests and lay people have in Vatican II's vision for the church as a whole. Now, it was not really expected just after the close of the Vatican Council in the mid-60s that in 1967 there would be an explosion of charisms in the Catholic Church. And this happened in the Duquesne weekend that initiated the, began the charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church in 1967. So when this happened in the early 1970s, many leaders in the charismatic renewal began to meet with the Pope. And the Pope at that time was Pope Paul VI. And he commented to leaders of the renewal in the early 70s, our curiosity, yet is a very legitimate and beautiful curiosity, is focused on another aspect. When the Holy Spirit comes, he grants gifts. We already know of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he also gives other gifts, which are today called, well, now they have always been called charisms. What is the meaning of charism? It means gift. It means a grace. They are particular graces given to one person for another in order to do good. One receives the charism of wisdom in order to become a teacher. And another receives the gift of miracles in order to perform deeds which through wonder and admiration call others to the faith. These kinds of charismatic gifts are gratuitous gifts. Obviously not strictly necessary, of course, but are given out of the superabundant economy of the Lord. The Lord wishes to make the church richer, more animated, more capable of defining herself, of documenting herself, and this is precisely called the effusion of charisms. Today, much is said about it. Having taken into account the complexity and delicateness of the subject, we cannot but desire that these gifts come, and may God grant it with abundance. Besides grace, let God's church also be able to obtain and possess the charisms. This is fascinating because when a particular renewal movement of the church is accepted with such strong language by the highest teaching authority of the church, the Pope, that is significant. This is not meant to be some sort of minor, insignificant, uh, in the back corners of the church experience. <laughs> Rather, through the embrace by the magisterial authority of the church, of the charismatic renewal movement, this has been brought, as we might say, into the heart of the experience of the church. Pope Paul VI went on to write, nothing is more necessary to this more and more secularized world than the witness of the spiritual renewal that we see the Holy Spirit evoking in the most diverse regions and milieu. How then could this spiritual renewal not, renewal not be a chance for the church and for the world? And how in this case could one not take all the means to ensure that it remains so? So he's identifying this movement of the Holy Spirit as a, an opportunity, a chance for the church, a chance for the world. He goes on to write, the charismatic renewal ought to rejuvenate the world give it back a spirituality, a soul, religious thought. It ought to reopen its closed lips to prayer and open its mouth to song, to joy, to hymns, and to witnessing. It will be very fortuitous for our times, for our brothers, that there should be a generation, your generation of young people who shout out to the world the glory and the greatness of the God of Pentecost. You see the excitement, the, the dynamism that Pope Paul VI identifies in the movement of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers. And this movement of the Holy Spirit is not 
limited in any sense to the, the bounds of the visible Catholic Church, but it's a, a wave of renewal that embraces all Christian denominations. He goes on to write, in the hymn which we read this morning in the breviary, there is a phrase which is too hard to translate, yet should be very simple. Laity bibamus sobrium profusionem spiritus, which in Latin translates to, joyfully let us drink in well moderation of the outpouring of the spirit. This could be a formula, indication for your program. The second message is for these pilgrims present at this great assembly who do not belong to your movement. They should unite themselves with you to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, the spiritual renewal of the world, of our society and of our souls, so that they too, devout pilgrims to this center of the Catholic faith, might nourish themselves on the enthusiasm and the spiritual energy with which we must live our religion. We will say only this, today either one lives one's faith with devotion, depth, energy, and joy, or that faith will die out. That is so true. If we do not live our faith with dynamism and joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, that faith will die. Jesus promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church, but he did not promise that the church would exist in a particular place or a particular time. We can fall away from the Holy Spirit's action, and if we do, we will die out. Pope Paul VI's teaching on the charismatic renewal was reinforced and strengthened by Pope John Paul II. He often spoke to gatherings of charismatic renewal leaders, so I provide for you now some quotes from him as he spoke them to renewal leaders. Thanks to the charismatic movement, many Christians have rediscovered Pentecost as a living and present reality in their daily life. I desire that the spirituality of Pentecost be spread in the church as a renewed thrust of prayer, holiness, communion, and proclamation. Today, I would like to cry out to all of you and to all Christians, open yourselves docilely to the gifts of the Spirit. Accept gratefully and obediently the charisms which the Spirit never ceases to bestow on us. Do not forget that every charism is given for the common good, for the benefit of the whole church. I am convinced that this movement of charismatic renewal is a very important component of the entire renewal of the church. I can understand all these different charisms. They are all part of the richness of the Lord. I am convinced that this movement is a sign of his action. Now, John Paul II had an understanding of the connection between the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of evangelization. So he goes on to write, the Spirit has guided the church in every age, producing a great variety of gifts among the faithful. Because of the Spirit, the church preserves a continual youthful vitality, and the charismatic renewal is a so eloquent manifestation of this today, a bold statement of what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I'd like to share with you now a story of Pope John Paul II that was told by Father Raniero Cantalamesa at a priest, seminarians, and deacons conference at Steubenville University in the early 1990s. Not long after he became Pope, John Paul II told Father Raniero Cantalamesa, who was and still is the preacher to the papal household, Raniero, I want to receive the gift of tongues. Now, Father Raniero replied, Holy Father, you already speak all these different languages. Why do you want the gift of tongues? And the Pope replied, I want the language of prayer, the prayer of the angels. So Father Raniero says, okay. He lays hands on the Holy Father, which must have been kind of a, 
an unusual thing to do. And he prays for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that he might receive the gift of tongues. Well, nothing apparently happened at that moment, so they wrapped up their prayer, trusted in faith, and went on their way. Now, Father Aniara's office was just down the, down the hallway from the Holy Father's office at the Vatican. So one day, when Father Aniaro had finished meeting with a couple and was walking back to his office, suddenly the Holy Father bursts out of his doors and comes running towards him, saying, Raniero, Raniero, I got tongues, I got tongues. The Holy Father was so excited that he had received this gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is just to say that this is not a mere theoretical understanding of charismatic renewal, but the hierarchy of the church has an experiential understanding of charismatic renewal. Let's move on to Pope Benedict XVI. Now, many of these quotes from him were taken from when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in the 80s and the 90s. And he wrote in several of his books about charismatic renewal. He writes, what is hopeful at the level of the universal church and that is happening right in the heart of the crisis of the church in the Western world is the rise of new movements, which nobody had planned and which nobody has called into being, but which have sprung spontaneously from the inner vitality of the faith itself. What is manifested in them, albeit subdued, is something like a Pentecostal season in the church. I am thinking, say, of the charismatic movement, of the Curcios, of the movement of Focolare, of the neocatechumenal communities, of communion and liberation, etc. The joy of the faith that one senses here has something contagious about it. What is striking is that all this fervor was not elaborated by any office of pastoral planning, but somehow it sprang forth by itself. What is emerging here is a new generation of the church, which I'm watching with a great hope. I find it marvelous that the spirit is once more stronger than our programs and brings himself into play in an altogether different way than we had imagined. Our task, the task of the office holders of the church and of theologians, is to keep the door open to them, to prepare room for them. The period following the council scarcely seemed to live up to the hopes of John the 23rd, who looked for a new Pentecost, but his prayer did not go unheard. In the heart of a world desiccated by rationalist skepticism, a new experience of the Holy Spirit has come about, amounting to a worldwide renewal movement. What the New Testament describes with reference to the charisms as visible signs of the coming of the Spirit is no longer merely ancient past history, this history is becoming a burning reality today. And he wrote this in the Ratzinger Report of 1985. A striking analysis of how the Holy Spirit is breathing life into a church in the midst of a society that is stripping away all references to the mystical life, to a spiritual life that this is an antidote to the secularizing power and force of modern society. He goes on to write that the local churches must not turn to their own pastoral plans, or rather must not turn their own pastoral plans into a criterion of what the Holy Spirit is allowed to do. An obsession planning could render the churches impervious to the action of the Holy Spirit, to the power of God by which they live. Not everything should be fitted into the straitjacket of a single uniform organization. What is needed is less organization and more spirit. What a striking tone that oftentimes people don't expect from someone uh, of the theological caliber and the, the hierarchical orientation of uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. But he understands the role of the spirit in the renewal of the church. He finally writes, I am really a friend of movements, 
communion and liberation, focolare, and the charismatic renewal. I think this is a sign of the springtime and of the presence of the Holy Spirit, who today will give new charisms and so on. This is, for me, really a great hope that is not, that not within organization from authorities, but really it is the force of the Holy Spirit present in the people. And finally, he expressed the following invitation as Pope at Pentecost just a few years ago in 2008. Today, I would like to extend this invitation to everyone. Let us rediscover, dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let us be aware again of our baptism and of our confirmation, sources of grace that are always present. Let us ask the Virgin Mary to obtain a renewed Pentecost for the church again today a Pentecost that will spread in everyone the joy of living and witnessing to the gospel. This has been the third segment of Father Terry Donahue's teaching on Baptism of the Holy Spirit. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Baptism of the Holy Spirit. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on Baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the new Pentecost is coming from God to the church now because we need it now. We are entering a new missionary age. So you might ask, well, how can I be empowered by the Holy Spirit? How can I experience a new Pentecost in my life? I'd like to begin today by reading a passage of scripture from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. In this verse, it says the following, Therefore encourage one another, and build up one another, just as you are also doing. And further along in verse 14, it says, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all. St. Paul, in these scriptures and in many others, calls us to be a support to one another. This is a very foundational way to express Christian love. It shows that we care when we offer encouragement. The word encouragement actually comes from the Greek, and it means literally to call alongside. And it presumes that the one who we're ministering to is under pressure, is faint-hearted or overwhelmed, and we're called to give appropriate aid. And that's what we are called to do as Christians. We are called to encourage the faint-hearted, to help one another. Biblical encouragement, it presumes that Christians are under even more intense pressure, not just the pressures of everyday life, but also because of serving Christ, we are under additional pressure because of the spiritually hostile environment in which we live. So there's even more need to encourage one another from one Christian to another. And it's important to remember that however we speak to people, our words are so, so powerful. You know, statistics show that we remember the negative words much more readily than anything positive stated to us. So it's important to watch how we speak, even when we're exhorting or admonishing one another, to do so in a positive spirit. Also as Christians, it should be our goal to be known as encouragers, and there's many ways that we do that. First of all, we need to be effective listeners. We need to learn to listen to people, and just to really hear what they have to say, being patient with them as they express their, their need or their concern. Number two, we need to pray for one another, and I don't mean just just saying, oh, I'll pray for you and going on and forgetting about it, but real prayer because there is power in prayer. And when we pray, we do see things happen, so it's important to do that. We're also supposed to offer one another words of encouragement from God's Word because His Word is living and real and makes a difference. And when we, we believe it and we quote it, uh, we really get something out of that. We're consoled. And finally, we need to also follow up and make sure that those we're praying for and helping and supporting that we're really genuinely interested in them and we follow up and, and we see how they're, how they're doing. Um, Galatians 6.2 says the following, We're to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. 
It's also important to note that God is the greatest encourager of all. So that's why it's important to read his word because in it we'll find how much he loves us, how he cares for us, how he's there to see us through any situation and deliver us from all evil. We also need to turn to prayer because prayer is a real consolation as we, we pray for our own needs. We need to pray that God will console us. It's in prayer that we get real encouragement. I find that when I've neglected to pray because of the busyness of life, and we all know how that is, I just get so heavy and burdened. But when I go to prayer, and I especially love to go to my parish or a parish nearby and pray before the Eucharist, I find that when I come out, I feel the burdens are lifted and I feel God has indeed encouraged me. So it's important to really uh, remember not only to give encouragement, but to seek that encouragement from God Himself. If we at Food for Life likewise can offer encouragement through praying with you, through whatever you might be experiencing, we really take these prayer requests seriously and we pray over them faithfully. I'd invite you to write into us at Food for Life. We'd like to hear from you. It's our joy to serve you here on, on Food for Life. We know that many people are really blessed by our ministry here. I travel around Canada and, and, and speak with a lot of people who, who really are blessed by our, our ministry. And so we thank you for, for joining us on Food for Life. And once again, invite you to, uh, to support our ministry through, through your prayers and also your, your financial uh, gifts. Uh, the, the ministry, of course, relies on the financial support of our viewers. And so we, we just once again invite you to consider uh, making a donation to Food for Life Ministry so that we can continue this good work that the Lord has, has begun uh, here in, in Food for Life. Thank you and God bless you. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1405 and today's topic, Father Terry Donahue on Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. If every viewer gave a loony or a toony each week, all expenses would be met. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life, and our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on Baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the new Pentecost is coming from God to the church now because we need it now. We are entering a new missionary age. So you might ask, well, how can I be empowered by the Holy Spirit? How can I experience a new Pentecost in my life? This has been the third segment of Father Terry Donahue's teaching on Baptism of the Holy Spirit. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8.